Okay. Thanks, Mariana, and uh, thanks everybody for joining us tonight. My name is Fraser Haney, and I'm one of the volunteer uh, board members at the California Desert Coalition. Uh, the CDC is an all volunteer grassroots nonprofit <clears throat> whose mission is to impact local, state, and federal public policy decisions on behalf of the California desert ecosystem and its communities. Um, several of Mr. Uh, Richard Lettringer, Mariana McGuire, um, April Sauls, our board president, and Claudia is our board secretary uh, and, and treasurer, and so much more. Uh, also on our board is Yanina um, Galvan and Seth Steyer, and uh, so we're, we're happy to have board members join us tonight, and thank you all for your work on our board. This webinar tonight on rooftop solar is part of a webinar series. Um, if you sign up for an email from us on our website, you'll get reminders as we schedule these other webinars. Uh, we've got another one planned in November that we're just putting together about how uh, rooftop solar will impact future transmission and hopefully a lack thereof. So a special thanks tonight to our speakers, Dave Rosenfeld and Chris Clark. Uh, who have given us their time and put together some really good information for us to consider. And I think as you all know, those who live in the California desert, um, it's always been a critical time for the last 15 years about the future of But we're at a critical juncture right now. There's a few major things going on. Per a, a forecast from the California Energy Commission related to SB 100, which says that 60% of our power has to come from clean energy sources by 2030 and 100% by 2045, all while addressing energy equity. That means that um, it could be over a million acres additional land needs to be built with wind and solar to meet those energy goals uh, over, the, over the coming 25 years. And that's a huge deal. Of course, we're looking to rooftop solar to um, help save a lot of those acres. And uh, Dave Rosenfeld at the Solar Rights Alliance is going to start us off by telling a, us about a campaign he is Frazier. running. Um, you what? It's Frazier. Oh. I'm kind of Please mute everyone. There we go. I got him. Uh, Hopkins, we had to mute you. We're on in the background. So, um, so, Tonight, uh, we're gonna hear from Dave and Chris. They're each gonna give a presentation. If you have questions for Dave or Chris, please put them in the chat. The chat's right at the bottom of the screen for those of you who aren't as familiar with Zoom. Uh, you click it, make sure that the message is going to everyone and then just start loading questions up in the chat. I'll read those off during the Q&A session. If you'd prefer, you can raise your hand when we get into the Q&A session. Uh, also in the controls on the bottom of your screen, and I will uh, pick you out and make sure that we make room for you to ask questions to our speakers. So uh, while they're presenting, please hold your questions and stay on mute. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and read uh, Dave's uh, bio. Uh, Dave Rosenfeld is the executive director of the Solar Rights Alliance. He's been a community organizer for over 20 years, and he believes people power is the best way to overcome special interests. Prior to joining the Solar Rights Alliance, Dave led a successful statewide ballot measure campaign in Oregon to restore career technology. And Before that, he led a 40,000 member public interest organization successfully worked to reduce health insurance premiums for consumers and combat government corruption. In addition to spending time with his wife and two children, he enjoys running, backpacking, studying, science, and philosophy. So welcome, Dave. Um, thanks very much. I'll turn it over to you. And I know that you've got some slides to share. So take it away. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I want to thank you for just everything that you do to protect Mother Earth. Um, somebody's got to do it, and it couldn't be any better people than you. Um, so let me share my screen and get right to it. And if folks wouldn't mind, 
Did I just get like a, just a thumbs up that you can see the word Save California Solar on your screen? All right, awesome. Okay, uh, I got about 10, I think this should be about 10 minutes uh, just to kind of do a flyover, like I said, and, and then Chris will go and then we can do lots of Q&A. Uh, so what we're trying to do here is Save California Solar. When I say solar, I mean rooftop solar. Um, and so just quickly about Solar Rights Alliance. So that's my organization that I run. Um, it's uh, we're the nonprofit association of California solar users. We believe everyone has the right to make energy from the sun without unreasonable interference from the utility. We keep track of what politicians, and regulators, and utilities are up to. And then we alert both solar users and the general public when there's a threat to solar or an opportunity to expand it. Um, we're, we're about 50,000 solar, mostly solar users on our list. There are some people on our list that don't have solar but either want it or um, you know, just support solar in general. Um, I am the one and only paid staff person. Everything else is volunteer run. Um, we have a great board of directors that's made up of solar users. I'm not going to play these videos, but if you want to just understand the organization more, I just wanted to evoke that. Um, so that's about us. But then more importantly is the coalition that we're, we, at my perch at Solar Rights Alliance, I'm spending most of my time these days um, trying to stitch together a coalition working to save solar that's beyond solar users. Um, and, um, you know, so this is a coalition of about 350, or, uh, over 350 organizations and community leaders. And, you know, everyone, different groups and different interests come in through different motivations. But the thing that we're more or less unified around is we should be continuing to grow rooftop solar and battery storage. We should grow it more equitably so that millions of working and middle class people can get it. And that net metering is a really, really key policy that gets us there. It's not the only one, but it's one of the most important ones. And that's the thing that's at stake here. Um, and I just want to, I think for this group, and frankly, for me personally, I think a lot, one of the motivations that I think a lot of us think about is um, we should be doing rooftop solar because if we don't, then the renewable energy transition is going to be just needlessly opening, going after open space, beautiful places, um, important other living things, um, and also sacred lands that um, you know Native Americans have inhabited for an awfully long time. Um, and instead, we could be doing this um, in increasing numbers. This is actually an affordable housing development. Uh, we recently went in um, fully with rooftop solar and zero net energy. I don't really need to sell this crowd very much on why we need more rooftop solar, but for posterity's sake, it's useful to run through it. So today we have 1.2 million solar rooftops operational in the state of California. And I think it's good, and it's good to kind of know, no, 15 years ago when the Million Solar Roofs Initiative was launched, there was only 20,000 solar systems in the entire state. And even as early as, as much as 10 years ago, if you wanted solar, you had to be either rich, technical, or highly motivated. And today you don't have to be any of those three things. Um, just under half of all new solar is going into working in middle-class neighborhoods, um, you know, at or below, you know, kind of like whatever the income cutoffs are that define that thing. That is amazing. And what we want is to accelerate that trend um, so that in the coming years, we can get millions and millions and millions of working and middle-class people, whether you're a renter or a homeowner, um, the opportunity to be able to make your own energy. And I think there's four good reasons why this is a good idea, um, whether you have solar or not. First, it's just people ought to have more control over their energy bills. Um, the days of having to choose between buying groceries and paying your utility bills should be gone. Um, we have the technology to deal with that. Second is blackouts. Um, right now, as long as we have long distance power lines, as long as we are dependent on them to deliver electricity, then um, just millions and millions and millions of people every single year are gonna have their power go out for long periods of time. But this is more, if you are living at the margins um, of the income level, then that is more than an inconvenience. Having your food spoil for um, you know, weeks worth of food spoil in your fridge is a big deal. Schools having to shut down, we know is a big deal for all the parents out there. Um, if you are reliant on medicine to keep your you know, refrigerator, keep your medicine cold, or to charge your um, wheelchair or dialysis machine, this is a big deal. And the only solution, the only one that you could scale up to protect people from blackouts is solar paired with a battery. Um, third reason is how Fraser really introduced it, so I don't need to really belabor this, but just if the state's going to try to have to triple the amount of wind and solar energy, which is what they say they're going to need to do to get to 100% clean, while at the same time getting everyone to then use more electricity with cars and appliances, then they're going to need to triple all forms of wind and solar, and that includes rooftop. So if all of a sudden you take rooftop out of the picture, then it puts even more pressure out um, into the open spaces that we're working to protect. Um, there's already enough pressure that would put even more. And there's a lot of turtles and native tribes 
and others who care about open space would have something to say about that. And then the final reason is that even if you don't care about any of this stuff, um, rooftop solar um, reduces the cost of the electricity grid and saves everybody money. So the most detailed energy modeling that has been done to date in the United States has found the two scenarios, one with which California goes to full decarbonization um, with just large scale renewable energy, and one with which California gets to full decarbonization with both large scale wind and solar and also rooftop solar in a really, really, really big way. And lo and behold, the scenario that has rooftop solar in, in a big way is $120 billion cheaper um, over the next 30 years than if you just go at large scale alone, which this group, I think you understand even better than most because your origin story, as I just learned a moment ago, was about stopping a transmission line system from getting built um, through sensitive areas. It turns out the reason why we're paying out of our nose for electricity is long distance transmission lines and distribution, the transmission and distribution system. And that is the elephant in the room. It turns out also that utilities are um, incentivized literally by the government to build more long distance transmission and distribution. Um, they take um, seven to 10% off of every of profit, off of every dollar that they get to spend building and maintaining long distance power lines. So as a result over the last 20 years, that perverse incentive has driven them to build and build and build and build and build, um, whether or not we need it, whether or not they maintain it, um, as in the case of PG&E. And this is seen in the rates. And when people make their own energy at um, home, then they don't use those long distance power lines as much, which reduces wear and tear, which reduces maintenance and ultimately reduces the need for new construction. And when you scale that up over a 20 year time period with the clean energy transition, it turns out you save gobs and gobs of money, which every rate payer saves money. And by the way, you don't have time to get into it, but, and you're gonna do a future webinar all about this topic, but those savings aren't some future thing. They're happening right now. And we have lots of amazing examples of how we would be paying more right now were it not for rooftop solar. Um, so the utilities see it another way, and they are right now lobbying the California Public Utilities Commission to double the cost of rooftop solar with two basic proposals. One is to hit solar users with a monthly solar penalty fee. Depending on where you live and the size of your system, um, it would range. But you can see here you know, in the deck what the range would be. The first three bullets are if you're a residential customer. And then if you're a larger commercial customer with like a 250 kilowatt system, a business or a farm or a school or a church, you'd be paying between $1,000 and $3,500 a month. Um, that alone would kill the market. But then on top of that, the utilities also want to eviscerate the credit that solar users get for sharing their extra energy with the community, with the grid. And they want to cut that by 80%. Right now it's about 25 cents per kilowatt hour, and they want to cut it basically down to like five to seven cents, which is buckets. And if you take those two things together, you basically end up doubling the cost of going solar, and you roll us back 15 years into the past where you, the only people that could get solar were those that were super rich. Um, the decision makers are the California Public Utilities Commission. Um, they are a group of five political appointees unelected. They're appointed by the governor and they are in the middle of what's called a proceeding. The proceeding has been underway since the end of last year and it is expected to wrap up at the beginning. They will make their final decision at the beginning of either January or February. And um, so that's the technical decision makers, but um, I am here to basically tell you that if you remember one thing, it's about this guy, um, because the governor is the boss of the state. And even though he doesn't have any technical power over the CPUC's decision making, the governor does appoint the CPUC or reappoint. And frankly, I think we all know, um, this is a group of very savvy organizers, that in the end, all of this stuff is about raw power. And when a governor decides that something needs to happen, the governor makes those things happen. And especially when the thing that the CPC might be doing runs at odds with his climate change goals and all the things he's saying about blackouts and helping the people and blah, 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 he might make a political decision that he does not want to have rooftop solar killed on his watch, especially somebody as ambitious as this gentleman. So we are both focused on these folks because we have to, and we are focused on this gentleman because he's ultimately going to be the one who comes down uh, on this whole thing. What do the utilities say? They say that your solar is the reason why electricity rates are going up, that rooftops, rooftop solar users don't pay their fair share of the grid, and that they're overly generously subsidized with this net metering credit, and it's your fault 
that everybody's paying out of their nose for electricity bills. It's a whole bunch of hooey. Um, this cartoon kind of sums it up, um, where they're basically, they're getting guaranteed profits um, off of the power lines that they build and then neglected to maintain and then burn 5% of the state down, and they need to find a scapegoat, and that is rooftop solar. But to be a little bit more specific, um, the, the whole thing is about long-distance power lines. This year, rate payers are charged $9 billion for both long-distance power line maintenance and construction and wildfire mitigation, the whole grid hardening thing um, that we probably need to do. But obviously, the utilities have an interest in pumping that number up as much as they can because it keeps us hooked on the thing that they get their profits on, 8 to 10% a year, mostly off their long-distance power line spending. That's why electricity bills are going up. And rooftop solar, as a reminder, is one of the few things that actually lowers the cost of long-distance power lines because when more people make their own energy locally, they reduce the wear and tear on the long-distance power lines, which then they mean you don't have to spend and maintain as much um, to do that. So, um, and then just coming back to the whole thing, everybody benefits. And um, the vision that we have is something where everybody is able to get solar. This is an affordable housing development um, at Trinity River Elder Village, this is a native tribe. Um, and this is a chart that Redwood Energy, which is an affordable housing developer, did. And I just love this because it's just, here are the options that they were looking at when they were figuring out how to power this development. And the kind of standard one is at the top in orange, and then the um, solar energy one. So the actual bills that these folks are paying now, um, the individual residents of this development, is $5 a month. Um, this is amazing. So the win-win-win um, for both, the, there's just the gorgeous land that Mother Earth has and Father Son has bequeathed us with. Um, and the people, you know, is just so good here. It really is that good. And um, I'm just showing a few pictures of this is a affordable um, senior citizen development. This is a farm worker. You can't see the solar, but I swear to God it's there. Um, Redwood Energy gave me this. So if you don't believe me, we can go get them on the phone. Um, and then the public is totally with us. We did a poll in January to the shock of no one. Rooftop solar is incredibly popular with Republicans and Democrats. Um, I know this from firsthand because Solar Rights Alliance, our membership is very diverse. Um, vast majority support net metering. And even when we give them the utility argument, they still end up supporting net metering by overwhelming numbers. Like I said, over 350 organizations, many of them are organizations that you're involved with. And in fact, Chris, who will talk about it, thank you, Chris, delivered a letter to Governor Newsom and the CPUC um, last week from over 55 conservation organizations basically saying, dude, you got to weigh in. This is a big deal. Um, and then there's lots of other environmental justice organizations, consumer organizations, community groups, um, that, you know, and, and lots of climate change groups as well that we're working with um, on this campaign. So our goal is more solar and batteries to millions more Californians. Um, we're running, we've been running a campaign for many, many months. We have three more months to go to get the governor to really take a stand here. Um, if you're wondering, okay, well, what can I do? We're already doing a lot. Um, if you have not yet sent your public comment to Governor Newsom and the CPUC, please do that. We've made it easy. You can go to this website. and We'll distribute all these materials um, to everybody if you don't already have it. And this is a pre-written form, but you can go in and customize it. Some of us, you know, activists, we like to kind of, you know, this is sort of like the automatic transmission version of sending a public comment. Many of us like to drive stick and kind of write your own thing and then submit it through the usual channels. We can help you do that if you prefer not to submit it through this form. But this is an easy way to do it, is sign it, share it, you know, and share it in whatever way that you can. The second thing um, that I want to pitch to this group is um, a Conservation Action Day at the CPUC. Um, Laura Cunningham from Basin Range Watch, who many of you might know, um, is suggesting that October 21st would be a great day for people who are working to protect the desert, who are working to protect the open space that is left that has not yet been ruined um, by development. To be at the CPUC, it's online, so that makes it easy. You don't have to go anywhere. Um, on October 21st, they have a voting meeting and public comment is open at 10 a.m. and everybody who signs up can get two minutes. And what would be awesome is try to imagine just lots and lots and lots, like 20, 30, even 50 people who are on the front lines like yourself um, working to protect open space, if they all heard from you on that one day. And then also we're just amplifying it on social media accounts. We can help you do some press. Um, that would have a big impact, not just on the CPUC, but we know the governor's staff is watching the CPUC proceedings. Um, and if they saw a big string of people like yourself just going one after the other and hammering home 
the message that you guys have been doing every single day and have been doing it for decades. That would be really, really, really impactful. So I'm gonna put in the chat, um, we made a, a little RSVP form. You can, you don't need, and we also made a little toolkit that has instructions on how to testify at the CPUC. It's very, very, very easy because it's online. And I'll put that in the chat so that you've got access to that. And um, so I would just encourage folks to do that. There's lots of other things you can do. Um, and you know, this is an experienced group of activists, so I don't need to really belabor the point. So I'm gonna stop my screen share and uh, turn it over to uh, Chris, or back to Frazier to turn it over to Chris. Yeah, Dave, thank you very much. That was great, Dave, and uh, very succinct. And I, I love the actions that you gave there at the end. Um, just to remind folks, we will post this presentation on our website after uh, in, the, in the next few days. And we'll also make available the materials, uh, the links that Dave was talking about there uh, to make it easy for everybody to follow up and uh, get to the CPUC meeting on the 21st and uh, sign the petition and get a comment in. And uh, Dave was kind enough to drop some links and materials in the chat box. Uh, for those of you who want to just click right through to them there. So uh, now we're going to pivot to our friend and uh, an ally, Chris Clark. Hi, Chris. Um, I think every one of you on the call should know Chris. If you don't, you should get to know Chris. Uh, Chris joined the Parks and Association in 2017 as the California Desert Associate Director. He works with desert communities to protect national parks, monuments, and other protected places and the landscapes that surround them. Uh, prior to joining NPCA, Chris was the environment editor at the Los Angeles-based KCET, which is the nation's largest independent public television station, uh, where he was responsible for breaking numerous stories about threats to desert national parks. Before that, Chris worked as publications director at Earth Island Institute, where he published the award-winning Earth Island Journal, whose content shifted noticeably toward a focus on desert issues during his tenure. A California resident since the early 1980s, Chris has lived in the California desert since 2008. Right now, he lives in 29 Palms with his wife, Laura, and their dog, Hart. Uh, so Chris, the floor is yours. Take, take it away. Thank you, Fraser. It's great to see everybody tonight. I hope you're all doing well. It's been way too long uh, since seeing some of you and really looking forward to when we can safely do this all in the same general vicinity and breathe each other's air. Uh, I'm gonna quickly share the screen here. Some of this will not be, uh, not be new to some of you. I just basically wanted to remind us all of why this is, <clears throat> why this is important for desert conservation. I mean, we all know that we need to uh, stop uh, throwing monkey wrenches into the global climate. We all know that uh, rooftop solar is a really good idea for a number of reasons, including uh, uh, efficiency and economic democracy and things like that. But uh, as, as some of you know better than I do, uh, there are some significant wildlands conservation issues that go along with uh, um, promoting rooftop solar as opposed to remote giant utility scale solar. And I'm starting off with this photo because it just makes me really happy. Um, and it's also kind of a good indication of how subjective visual resources and, uh, and such things can be because this uh, was a pallet of about eight kilowatts of uh, uh, PV panels, photovoltaic panels. Uh, in my driveway last month, they're now on my rooftop. And I was just thinking if this went up in the open space across the road from me, I would be really upset. But right now it makes me very, very happy, especially considering uh, all the number of times I've been called a NIMBY for opposing utility scale solar. And I am like literally putting it in my backyard now. So, so take that everybody. Um, but the point is that, uh, this stuff is modular. You know, you can you can take any of the solar panels that are in the giant multi-thousand acre uh, PV developments and put them one at a time on bus shelters and uh, you know uh, drive-through espresso places and wherever there's a little bit of built environment, 
you don't need to put them all together in, in the same place. And that's really a strength of the technology. At any rate, um, when you look at uh, where solar and its relationship to the desert has been, this is uh, solar one and Daggett as it looked uh, a couple decades ago. Things have really, really shifted as far as the conservation community is concerned. This used to be like the pride and joy of almost all conservationists here. Um, I think Pat Flanagan was one of the earliest people that knew that this place was uh, causing some conservation issues. And I can tell you as, uh, as somebody that was publishing uh, environmental uh, news and, and that kind of thing up in the Bay Area, this was the idyllic future. Um, and nowadays I look at it and I see there is absolutely nothing on the ground under those mirrors. That's a devoid of biological value. And that is actually one of the big issues with utility scale solar is the wholesale conversion of what had been habitat for plants, animals, and those interesting organisms that don't quite fit into either category. Uh, here's a, a solar uh, thermal parabolic trough mirror set up uh, near Kramer Junction. Again, uh, absolutely sterile ground in between. And this is an issue uh, in most large solar facilities. This is an aerial shot of part of the uh, mirror, the uh, heliostat field. It's a fancy way of saying garage door size mirrors at the Ivanpah Solar Electric Generating Station. And you can see that there are a few weeds growing in there, but everything has been pretty much mowed down and in some, case, some cases rooted out. It's uh, essentially uh, several thousand acres of former desert that is now um, a nursery for invasive exotic plants like tumbleweeds and red brome and Mediterranean split grass. Um, and it is no longer habitat for these guys. Uh, interesting uh, thing that some of you will remember, the um, Ivanpah Solar uh, Project, which is that big Eye of Sauron style thing, Eye of Sauron times three thing that's adjacent to I-15 just as you're heading into Vegas from uh, from California, uh, was originally thought to be on land that housed maybe 20 desert tortoises. And um, they ended up uh, having to relocate nearly 200 adult tortoises and nobody really knows uh, how many eggs or juveniles uh, that were uh, were harmed or killed by the construction. You know, those eggs don't move around very much until they hatch. And even after that, the juveniles like to stay in their burrows. And, uh, you know, you had really, really good tortoise biologists working on the Ivanpah site. And they will tell you if you run into them in the Joshua Tree Saloon in the right night that they missed a lot of them. And most of them wish they had never heard the name Ivanpah. Uh, this is just a uh, a piece from Julie Cart's uh, contemporary, contemporary article in the LA Times when Ivanpah uh, Bright Source, the contract, the uh, company that owned Ivanpah, was uh, dealing with finding way more tortoises than they thought. And uh, I just really like the, the phrase the company warned that tortoise mitigation was jeopardizing Ivanpah's viability. I'm talking about, you know, having your value system upside down. Uh, this could kill the project, those tortoises. They could kill that giant solar project, not the other way around. Anyway, uh, I remember when tortoises were what we were mostly worried about with Ivanpah. Uh, it was really just a question of getting the bulldozers on the site, getting those big uh, brush hogs to grind up those eight, nine, uh, 1100 year old Mojave yuccas. And uh, it turns out that there are a lot of other uh, conservation issues having to do with not just Ivanpah, but uh, the uh, somewhat less scary uh, large photovoltaic projects as well. I mean, I picked this, it is Ivanpah. It's a really, really evocative photo that uh, illustrates really well the, uh, the phenomenon I'm gonna talk about for a minute called the lake effect, but it's an issue with, uh, photovoltaic panels as well. If I had a photo of uh, a photovoltaic uh, power plant, we humans looking at it 
from this perspective could tell that it was a solar cell. But polarized light reflecting up into the uh, atmosphere looks a lot like water, apparently, to a lot of different birds. And so birds, uh, the uh, utility companies and the energy companies like to say that this has been disproven, but they don't point to anything that would actually disprove it other than their own uh, in-house studies. But uh, the California desert is part of the Pacific Flyway. And birds that use the Pacific Flyway often are going from water source to water source. Migration is really dangerous and really difficult. And when you land in a place that is not a water source, but is in fact a hard object, uh, you can end up in trouble as did this great blue heron that uh, tried to land in the Chukwala Valley uh, at a solar facility. So, uh, the lake effect is a documented uh, troublesome source of mortality of wildlife, uh, mainly birds, though I assume uh, probably bats uh, as well. You know, echolocating off of a big field of solar might sound a lot like a still lake. At any event, uh, you know, we've had species from this unfortunate heron to Yuma clapper rails to roadrunners to morning doves to, you know, just the collision risk for any of the hardscape uh, pieces of uh, the solar facilities is significant. And it's, uh, uh, it's not something that is absent with rooftop solar, but certainly birds that are in urban areas have bigger things to worry about than rooftop solar, namely the windows that are beneath the solar, uh, solar panel. So uh, it's not that, uh, not that the danger is non-existent if we move these into smaller groups in cities, but we don't have the same effect of having a thousand acres covered in a uniform looking surface that attracts birds from miles away. This is uh, another, uh, I'll put it this way, it's indication of an ecological trap that is set up by uh, projects like the Ivanpah Solar uh, project where lots and lots of mirrors concentrate solar on central boilers. And fortunately, uh, Ivanpah is just about the only functioning large uh, solar con concentrating solar power tower plant operating in the US at this point. And actually, I drove past it on Saturday and it wasn't operating. So, you know, uh, it's only operating part of the time. The, uh, the other one, uh, Crescent Dunes up in uh, Nevada near Tonopah has shut down. Uh, the operator wasn't making enough money. Ivanpah is getting propped up because it's really important uh, to its backers that it continue to appear to be making money, but is not so much a solar plant as a really inefficient natural gas powered plant. Um, but it is, when it's operating, it's visible from miles and miles away. I uh, have seen other photos uh, taken from the windows of airliners over 29 Palms in Barstow, where you can recognizably see the glint and glare from Ivanpah. And what happens is that, uh, unsurprisingly to anybody that's ever had a porch light, that light attracts insects. And those insects fly toward the light. Insects attract birds. The birds fly toward the light and uh, toward the insects. And they reach these areas of concentrated solar energy, which are in a sort of a donut shaped ring around it. We see it as two, two blobs like that. Uh, it's a sort of famous mystical kind of part of the movie uh, 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 Baghdad Cafe, which you might remember uh, Jack Polance painted the uh, solar flux from the, uh, uh, the Daggett Solar One and it was uh, uh, I saw it at the time as beautiful because I lived in the Bay Area. But uh, this is superheated, essentially plasma. And uh, birds follow insects into there. And you can, I decided not to use video of them being incinerated, uh, which exists and it's easily available online because uh, it's kind of grotesque. But what happens, and I picked one of the least grotesque photos that I could find, is that uh, birds that even come within shouting distance of those superheated uh, solar flux areas have their feathers melt and sometimes burn. And sometimes if they're flying fast enough, like picture a, 
a peregrine falcon in full dive after a pigeon that's sort of uh, having trouble, uh, they can burst into flame. Uh, they can, uh, you know, the flux will boil the uh, juices inside the bird and cause it to explode and the dry parts will burst into flame. And um, this was something that, uh, uh, again, credit where due, Pat Flanagan warned us about with uh, Daggett Solar One. She was a biologist that worked there and saw this in, in action decades ago. And uh, at KCET, I kind of was monomaniacal mono reporting on this for several months until Reuters and uh, Agents France Press and uh, AP and the Wall Street Journal and folks picked up on it. Uh, some of them gave me credit, some of them didn't. But um, the important thing was that it got, got to be known. And now, if people don't know anything about utility scale solar in the California desert, they know that it kills birds, which is a kind of a frustrating simpli simplification, but you know it works to organize against these things. Uh, and it's, a, it's an interesting sea change in, uh, in public attitudes. And nobody really thinks that rooftop solar kills birds, which is nice. Um, transmission, obviously, uh, talking to CDC, so I have to talk about transmission for a little bit. Uh, you know, in addition to being hella expensive and a guaranteed uh, profit line for utilities, it's also, uh, it's an environmental hazard just on its own, as we've seen with wildfires in, uh, in the Sierra and the coast ranges and the North Coast in the last few years where PG&E and San Diego Gas and Electric don't even try to argue that their power lines are not at fault. They just say, okay, you know, get the checkbook. And, you know, in addition to uh, that kind of broad level hazard, which is incredibly relevant in the desert, you know, it's just a really a matter of uh, circumstance that the dome fire wasn't caused by the power lines going through the Joshua Tree Forest and SEMA Dome, as opposed to lightning that hit a few miles north. There's the issue of providing perches for uh, raptors and birds of prey like ravens. and you know, if you, uh, in the Antelope Valley where this uh, power line photo was taken, if you see a raven's nest in a utility tower, uh, if you go under it, it's a pretty good chance that you're gonna find baby tortoise shells like that because they, they use those as uh, uh, base camps to uh, uh, scour the neighborhood, find things to eat, including tortoises, lizards, things like that. And uh, it really helps them out. It's a, it's a form of subsidy just like just like giving them extra water. So, uh, you know, we're right now fighting a uh, power line that's planned for uh, the state of Nevada that would come perilously close to the east edge of Death Valley National Park. Not only would it provide uh, raptor perches in places like the Nature Conservancy's uh, reserves along the Amargosa River near Beatty, uh, but it also really introduces a wildfire hazard in that part of the desert. And uh, if there's something that Death Valley National Park doesn't need, it's a source of ignition for wildfires. So, or one more. So all these uh, talks of things that we've known about uh, the risks of uh, renewable energy for quite some time. And uh, I know that the uh, Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan, AKA the DRECP is not uniformly well-loved in the desert conservation community. Uh, it was controversial from the outset. There were a lot of groups that worked to shape it. Some of those groups were happy with the impact they had. Others were uh, less satisfied. Uh, I find myself agreeing with all of them on alternate days. And I was, certainly was critical in my job at KCET of the uh, DRECP uh, writ large. But when it was uh, agreed on finally in 2015 and signed off on in 2016, nobody sued which was really remarkable. Uh, it's a remarkable achievement that nobody was upset enough by it to actually sue. Doesn't mean it's a great agreement, but it does mean it's probably as good as we could have gotten with the assumptions we went into uh, the process with. And uh, famously, the Trump administration, and it's been two weeks since I've actually said that name out loud and that feels really good. Um, I have to reset my clock now. But anyway, the previous administration announced early on that they were going to undo the DRECP and unified a whole lot of people who had been iffy about the plan 
and then in the first couple of months of the Biden administration, that uh, uh, that decision got rolled back again. And so, you know, we have an imperfect plan that at least on paper sets aside a huge amount of conservation land in the desert and protects it from uh, renewable energy uh, development and mining and a bunch of other uh, destructive pastimes. And in theory, on paper, uh, in places where renewable energy development in the desert is permitted or even streamlined, sets a certain standard for conservation in those areas uh, so that damage done by development will at least in theory be minimized. And uh, that sounded really good for a couple of weeks after uh, the Biden administration uh, uh, withdrew their amend the Trump's Trump administration's amendments to the DRECP until we started looking at plans for, this is uh, an ironwood tree on the site of the proposed Oberon solar power plant. Uh, the first power plant to be fully processed under the DRECP and that solar developer is already asking for amendments to the DRECP that will allow, allow them to build out uh, farther to the footprint of their, uh, their uh, right of way than the DRECP would allow. They want to encroach more on desert dry wash woodland like with this ironwood tree here uh, looking particularly picturesque in the uh, magic hour golden light. And, uh, you know, essentially a lot of us in the desert conservation field are asking, why did we go through all the trouble of negotiating the DRECP for 10 years and then fighting the previous administration's attempt to kill it for four more years just to have the BLM grant significant and damaging land use plan amendments uh, once it's saved that pretty much undermine the, the whole process. So basically, every eight kilowatts of solar that we can get on people's roofs in the state of California is eight kilowatts that doesn't need to go in land like this. It's eight kilowatts that doesn't need to uh, um, be pressure for developers to undermine complicated uh, negotiated agreements between industry and NGOs and tribes and agencies. And it's also eight kilowatts of uh, solar that, and I had to use this slide because Robin Kobali is here, uh, but it's eight kilowatts of solar that will not be interfering with the desert's natural ability to sequester carbon on a semi-permanent basis uh, in geologically stable form in the form of caliche that is created by desert plants in intact old growth desert habitat in the partnership with their uh, mycorrhizal uh, fun fungal partners and soil bacteria, all of which are working to save us from the climate crisis that we have created if we'll only just leave them the hell alone. So uh, I don't see a better reason from a desert perspective to make sure that the state of California doesn't uh, nuke our uh, our capacity to build out rooftop solar because as somebody that was involved in buying that big stack of uh, solar panels that was in my driveway next to my car, which cost less new than those solar panels did, despite the incentives and despite the fact that we're gonna get some of that money back in taxes, the cost of entry is still too high. You know, if we're worried, uh, even granting for the sake of argument, the utilities, uh, um, uh, argument that uh, people that are less affluent are unfairly burdened with the costs of, uh, of putting solar on rooftops. Uh, the answer to that is not slow down putting solar on rooftops. It's give the people you're worried about free solar to put on their rooftops and hook them up. And, you know, there's, there's no reason why we in the 21st century need to uh, ruin our planet and ruin our bank accounts in order to support a 19th century business plan on the part of three companies in the state of California. So 
uh, I'm veering into Dave's turf there, so I'll stop, but I just uh, really appreciative of this opportunity and very, very happy to talk to, uh, to all of you in the days and weeks to come, and I will be uh, giving testimony to the CPUC on the 21st. Thanks. That is a great job, Chris. Thank you very much. And uh, I too will be giving testimony on the 21st. I'm, I'm committed. Um, so we have got a couple things to, uh, to do at this point in the webinar. One is we'd like to move into question and answer. There's two ways to ask questions of our speakers. You can put things in the chat box here and I will read them off or you can raise your hand, uh, which you'll find if you look in your toolbar there's a button called reactions. And if you click on that, there's a way to raise hand. So if you want to, if you want to ask a question, go ahead and raise your hand or put it in the chat. Um, the first question comes in from Claudia Saul to Chris and asking Chris, could you elaborate a little bit more on Ivanpah becoming an inefficient natural gas plant? Claudia, did we agree on 10 bucks for you to ask that question? Uh, thanks. Um, yeah. Uh, it's a it's a really uh, strange and ironic thing, but uh, Ivanpah is a solar thermal plant. It fo it works by heating up a transfer fluid uh, in those boilers that are on top of those towers, and those uh, that transfer fluid turns turbines that are down in the buildings at the bottom. Uh, that transfer fluid needs to be a certain temperature in order to work, and so it gets pretty cold out there in the desert at night. Um, you know, I have colleagues in Alaska that laugh at me when I talk about it being cold in Southern California's Mojave Desert, but it, it gets down, you know, into the 40s and the 30s and uh, Ivanpah would not work for most hours of the day unless they had really, really big natural gas boilers uh, that were heating that transfer fluid before the sun comes up. And they pretty much do it every day. Uh, so they're burning a significant amount of natural gas to get that solar power. Thanks for that, Chris. Great question, Claudia. And uh, another really good question from Steve Bardwell. Thanks, Steve. Um, Chris, the uh, ISOs are pushing for an adoption of an avoided cost, or, or Dave maybe, uh, avoided cost calculator that pays little for excess rooftop generated power. Are the ISOs just going to have to accept lower profits or uh, can the ISOs offset the loss of long distance transmission profits with a different paradigm that includes more rooftop? Great job, Steve. Uh, Dave, Chris, either one of you want to jump in and take that? I think that's you, Dave. Uh, okay, so yeah, so just quick terminology is um, the, the, the avoided cost calculator is basically the computer model that the CPUC uses to do like their basic cost benefit analysis. Um, I think there's a lot of us that argue that the premise of the avoided cost calculator is screwed up to begin with. Um, and in any event, even if you accept the kind of basic premise that you can, I mean, one of the problems is it doesn't include a lot of the externalities that we're talking about here. And um, that's, that's my design. And um, to make it worse, this is me editorializing, but just, this is also background and I'll answer the question. Um, the consultant that the CPC is tasked with developing this calculator, this computer model, is if you look at their list of clients, almost all, all the three investor-owned utilities um, are, their, are their clients. Um, so they're, they're on the payroll of those guys. And then there's utilities around the country that hire them. And they're just known, this, this is E3 consulting, um, for basically just producing utility-friendly maps. And when we have looked at any of the work that E3 has done, they use just a number of very typical accounting tricks that the utilities also use to create their kind of phony cost shift number. So that's, but nonetheless, the avoided cost calculator, again, this computer model, um, is the thing that the CPUC looks at when they make their decision. And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, I mean, it's, it's, well, let me just say one more thing is that the CPUC in, this was it July that they did this? They, they basically cooked their calculator yep. even more. Like the calculator was already cooked pretty badly, but we were kind of hanging on and kind of using evidence in the calculator to kind of show, 
in this kind of narrowly framed way that the CPUC has forced us to talk about it, um, that rooftop solar still, you know, is like massively beneficial to everybody, whether or not you have solar, um, even without all the externalities and all this kind of stuff. And then the CPUC went in at the recommendation of the consultant with the backing of the utilities and then jimmied around with a couple of numbers in there um, that makes it look like large scale solar and wind is much cheaper than rooftop solar. And the way they jimmied that around was they basically cooked an assumption and said that they can build, and Chris, you'll correct me on the details, that instead of being able to build like two megawatts, and I'm not gonna get these numbers exactly right, but like two megawatts of large scale wind and solar a year, it's basically or, uh, every five years, two megawatts, they're saying they can basically build like 10 megawatts in the next five years, which they've never done before and they can't do, it would like override a bunch of permitting. And a lot of us went in and basically said, you can't do that. Like, like you literally can't do it. And the consultant and the CPUC said, well, if we put it down on paper, then it doesn't matter. Of course we can. And by kind of making it seem like they can build more large scale wind and solar in a shorter period of time, it makes it look like it's cheaper than rooftop solar. And there's like a, many of these things in the avoided cost calculator that kind of just screw around with the number. Again, again, putting aside, in addition, they don't factor in any of the externalities that Chris and others have gone through that would just make this complete slam dunk. So then um, I don't totally get the, the gist of Steve, your, your question then, but um, the, the, with, with respect to the utility profits, I don't think it really has anything to do with the avoided cost calculator. Uh, if anything, I mean, whether or not we grow rooftop solar, I think what we see is there is going to be a lot of large scale renewable energy development and we're going to need to have long distance power lines. I would like there to be, I think we could actually have a future where we need very little of it, but if we just kind of even accept kind of the best case scenario right now, you're going to have some of it. We're going to have to fight to make sure that it's in the, you know, we're going to have to fight to keep it from being in the most high value areas. And then we want to have a ton of rooftop. Utilities will still make a ton of profit off that. There's still going to be power lines that they're going to make a profit off. So there is no problem here with profit. The only thing that's going on here is that um, utilities just want it all. Like, they just don't want to have to share the table. I mean, it's like, pardon my French, but it is actually the living example of they are just greedy bastards because they, the situation, even with large growth of rooftop solar, still would allow them to make tons and tons of money. And it's just, they would make less money. And so I don't think that answers all the stuff that you put in there, Steve, so just feel free to reframe it. But that's a little bit of tutorial on the avoided cost calculator. And another reason why we're just trying to kind of say, there's, we got people who are fighting the details in the CPUC proceeding, and God bless them. But um, honestly, the reason why our strategy is just go after the governor and say, you have to keep rooftop solar growing. You cannot kill rooftop solar for X, Y, Z, common sense, third grade English reason is because we're just saying, screw your avoided cost calculator and your crazy process that nobody understands. We're just going to go to the guy in charge and we're going to use third grade English in language that the voters understand. And we're going to basically force them to make a political decision. So I suppose that's my punchline on, you know, the avoided cost calculator. That's a great punchline, Dave. Uh, Joan, you've got your hand up and then I'll go to Gloria's question in the chat. So Joan, take it away, please. Oh, uh, Joan, you're on. Yeah, good. Yeah. Thanks all and um, agreed with everything I've heard. And um, I just want to add that NRDC has been on the side of the utilities in their um, papers that they submit to CPUC and the CPUC has consistently refused to look at the plus side of local solar, the health benefits, the resilient benefits, um, the the amount of environment that it saves in the desert and other areas. But the basic thing I'd like to reinforce for people is that this is probably the most important fight, more important than fighting a particular solar project. Um, this is where the battle will be won or lost for the desert. And it's gonna be over the next year or so, I would say, if it drags out. So we're gonna to have to attend boring meetings. And what I do with the Solar Rights Alliance stuff is send it to all the rest of my family and the rest of California, because the governor needs to hear from people that aren't just in the desert. So I would just say, let's all hang in there. And um, regarding the CPUC, if you're gonna phone in, it's tricky. So you gotta know how to do it to get in the queue to speak. 
Thanks, Dave and, and Frazier and all. Thanks, Joan. That's great. Um, and Gloria had a question in the chat. Uh, Dave or Chris, are you familiar with grid alternatives? G-R-I-D in caps. It's been a couple of years since I uh, tracked them, but uh, when I was pretending to be an objective reporter at KCET, I uh, did a couple of stories on grid alternatives and they were really, really a good organization. They were deploying a lot of rooftop solar in neighborhoods where people really needed the help on their electric bills, uh, you know, East Oakland and uh, South LA and places like that. And, um, you know, I just, uh, I was a big fan at the time. And if I looked into them more and saw what they've been doing since, I probably would still be. I think we need more, more groups like them. Dave, any comments on that point? Yeah, great group. They're bringing solar to a set of people who don't typically get it. And they're, they're an important part of the marketplace. Thanks, Gloria, for the question. And uh, thanks, Dave and Chris, for the comments. We're going to... Uh, Mariana, if you're on and able to, do you want to hop on? And we're going to take a poll just so that, um, and we'll do a, more Q&A after this quick poll, but we want to just know what you think of the webinar so far and how we're doing so we can make these better in the future. So Mariana, if you want to hop in, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, happy to. Um, thank you guys. I am going to launch a poll that's, that should appear on your screen. Um, I'm sorry, Frazier, it seems I'm having a technical difficulty. It was working before and now it is telling me I've logged in from another device and my polling session is inactive. Do you have access to it? Can you see it, Frazier? Nope, I sure can. You don't well, see in the bottom toolbar? Oh yeah. I, it says- I see the same it. Thing. Do you want me to try and launch it? Sure. sure. Thanks, April. So as soon as one of us is able to launch it, you should see a poll um, on your screen. There's three questions. If you can fill them out, we'd greatly appreciate it. It helps us better understand um, what, what is valuable to our audience and how we can effectively um, spread the word about our webinars and communicate with you again in the future. Right, I see three and then what responses. I'll ask is, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, April. Oh, I, just, I see three responses coming in so far. So people are starting to build out. If you can just, yeah, see those questions and answer as efficiently and quickly as possible, we appreciate it. Great. And so we know there's, there's 23 participants. Uh, that includes some board members. Um, so I think we'll just give another minute to get a little bit more of a critical mass of responses, and then we'll continue on with Q and A. That's great. And next up, um, after the poll is done, next up, uh, I see that Robin Kobali and Doug Thompson have a hand raised there. Um, so I will, um, Sorry, go to Frazier. Jeff next in just one moment. Yes, just quickly, to, I apologize for interrupting. Um, Judy has put into the chat that she can't submit without answering the first question. And Judy, there should be, um, I, I apologize if there isn't an other selection in number one. Um, yeah, there there isn't, but that's okay. <laughs> I see, okay. Um, Fair enough. Uh, in that case, if if you want to just I said, a I said, random I'm, selection, <laughs> right. I'll make a note. <laughs> Apologies for that. Thanks for pointing that out. Okay. Okay. Very good. Um, can we go ahead and go to Robin and Doug? And uh, can you guys unmute and go ahead with your question, please?
right there. Okay. There you go. Hi. Um, I'm so glad that you uh, guys are running this uh, informative webinar. Uh, I just wanted to say that Doug and I have wanted rooftop solar for decades, and it was always, you know, $40,000 out of pocket and everything. Well, we are now excited to say that we are going to be getting solar within about 45 days. We signed up through Renova, and Renova has, uh, I mean, to me, it's a revolutionary thing that I want to stand out in the street and tell everybody about. There is not one dollar out of your pocket. They come in and look, they look at your energy bills for the last uh, 12 months, and they plan solar on your rooftop for uh, for us, it was, um, thanks, 126% of our use. And then we, uh, they will put it on and we will still have to pay um, Edison $12. $12 a month just to be connected. But then our bill, our um, electric bill for the next 25 years will be $153 a month. And that's it, no matter what we use or don't use. And we're so planning on getting a totally electric car and it excites us to the hilt that we can plug our car in and charge it with our rooftop solar. So I just want to tell everyone, look into Renova. We are just or so- one of those kind of companies. Or, or one of these companies that has no um, out-of-pocket money that just um, takes over the bill and they pay Edison and you pay them. And uh, it's- it's just a, a way that like you're the, I think Dave was talking about um, the, you know, middle class finally being able to get rooftop solar and this kind of a model where, um, and you know, that's not even counting the $12,000 tax rebate we're gonna get because of this. But at any rate, I just wanna say, look into Renova or any company that is offering this kind of a deal with no out of pocket. It's, uh, it's phenomenal. We can all get solar now. And uh, thanks, thanks Robin and Doug. Dave, I wonder for, uh, for a customer like Robin and Doug who are just getting ready to install rooftop solar for the first time, um, how would the policies that the CPUC is considering right now affect Robin and Doug? Yeah. Um... Thank you, Robin and Doug, and congratulations. I actually, I've been running Solar Rights Alliance for three and a half years. I just got solar a few months ago. So I was, I had people come out years ago and just, you know, middle-class people, right? Like it just, it just had to finally pencil out. So it's, a, it's an individual choice and, you know, each, pe each person has to make their own decision. So congratulations. Um, so here's the, I'm going to give a nuanced answer. So, you, so just work with me here, everyone. On the one hand, um, the CPUC has said that any changes that they make will not be applied retroactively. The utilities asked for the changes to be retroactive, and the, the CPU, there's a longstanding precedent in California established by Governor Brown, even in law, that says that solar users' investment and the, and the net metering arrangement that they're on should be honored for the lifetime of the asset, 20 years. Um, so the CPUC has at least said that's their intention. Um, so if that's true, then if you go solar this year, you'll be fine. What we're telling people is going, we don't trust the CPUC. We don't <laughs> trust the CPUC because the CPUC has not given the world much reason to trust them, um, you know, and not just related to rooftop solar. But also, we saw a few months ago, the utilities almost made an end run around the CPUC and almost passed um, legislation through the California legislature that would have just overridden the whole process. That was AB 1139, and many of you might have heard about it, and we killed it, but whew, that was like, we did not think we were going to kill it. That was just like, you know, we, just, we, you know, just, we pulled it off. Um, and then three is, despite um, all that, um, the hostile parties are still proposing to hit, make these retroactive. So it's almost like, yeah, 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 CPUC, we don't really believe you're going to stick to that. So we're just going to put this in our proposal anyway. And so I don't want to be over, over alarmist. You know, if, if I were you, I'd do it. But you have to make your own decision. Um, you know, and so I would just fight like your, your investment depends on this outcome. And if you get grandfathered in, mazel tov, you know, you'll be good and everyone gets screwed. But let's just fight, you know, because I don't think we can trust the CPUC. And so we should just fight like all of our investments you know, we're at stake here. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. 
great answer, Dave. Um, thanks again, Robin and Doug, for bringing that up. Uh, Richard on our board asks, uh, Dave or Chris, given that one major California utility is in bankruptcy, is there any value in having the state buy the utilities and run them in the interests of the people of the state? I would say uh, just based on my own general political philosophy, yes. Um, I think that these kind of uh, uh, vital services and they are life or death services for a lot of us uh, ought not to be run for profit. I feel the same way about hospitals. Um, that said, you know, basically what that means is that we would have municipal utilities or something similar. And as anyone in the Owens Valley can tell you, a municipal utility is not necessarily a benevolent organization. And so it's not gonna solve all of our problems to do it. Um, uh, actually, as people in Pioneer Town can tell you, the LADWP is not a uh, uniformly benevolent institution. So uh, certainly taking the profit motive, motive out of it is a good thing. And it, it might've been a lot harder to persuade LADWP not to uh, buy power from say Soda Mountain Solar, which my predecessor, David Lamfram was fighting on the uh, north end of Mojave National Preserve if LADWP had been entirely motivated by profit as opposed to living up to its charter to serve the people of Los Angeles. So uh, kind of a nuanced answer there, but it's certainly a step. Thank you, Chris. Um, and uh, can either one of you answer the following question? Um, maybe there's a list of resources like Robin mentioned with Renova for other solar companies out there that can help with rooftop solar, or I think Gloria mentioned grid alternatives earlier. Do you know, is there, is there a place that people can go to get those kind of resources? It's uh, the U S department of energy is a really good place to start. Uh, there are, uh, there are a couple of different models for solar. One of them is the one that Robin and Doug describe. It's essentially third party leasing. And it's kind of, um, it's a really good way for people without cash on hand to get solar on their roof. And you're basically betting against the company that uh, the cost of power that they're selling to the utility is not gonna uh, be way more than, uh, um, than what you're paying them because they're, they're hoping that it, they will get a lot more out of the deal than, uh, than you're saving, essentially. Um, but it, I mean, for people that don't have the money up front, it's a really, really good option. And there are, regardless of whether or not you're, you're pursuing an outright purchase of the solar or leasing the space on your roof to a third party, there is a lot of uh, caveat enter kind of situations out there. And so Going through, um, going through some of the clearinghouses like the state and the Federal Department of Energy have set up would be a really good thing. Uh, I have uh, info on the DOE um, clearinghouse about 100 yards away from where I'm sitting right now, so it's, I can't really get up and get it, but I'm, I'd be happy to send that around. Um, make sure that Moises gets it and maybe, you know, send it to you, Fraser, and you could get it out to the, the list. But it's, uh, it's really good to have, uh, have a sort of objective uh, third party to, uh, uh, to kind of act as the Better Business Bureau, because there is a lot of uh, a predatory behavior going on in, in the, the field. And if you, uh, if you ever feel like you're not getting nearly enough calls on your mobile phone, uh, put it into a solar company's uh, uh, database and you will start getting a lot of calls. You'll have a lot of friends. So you just need more info, right? Maybe yep. you just, you're, you're lonely. Um, Dave, thanks for posting. Add, um, I, I, yeah, go yeah, ahead. I, would, I just dropped our consumer guide in the chat. I, I just completely agree with Chris. Um, feel free to consult with our consumer guide. One of the top articles is six tips for how to find a solar installer that's right for you. Um, we don't make product endorsements. Um, like, you know, we won't recommend a, a company to you ever. Uh, what we'll give you is a methodology for just figuring it out, you know, how to make a good choice. And, you know, one of our top things is get three bids 
And then, you know, there's just a list of questions you got to ask. And then a link to kind of a bunch of other resources, including some of the ones that Chris just mentioned. So that's not the only thing that's out there. You should look around on the internet, but that consumer guide was written because, you know, yeah, there's, there's a lot of hucksters in every industry and solar is no exception. And um, there's a lot of great companies too. So there's a method to finding a good one and, you know, you should just follow the method. That's great. Uh, and thanks, Dave. Thanks, Chris. Um, and we'll just do another question or two, and then I'll turn it over to April to, to take us home and close, close this webinar up. Um, and one of our last questions here, we'd like to pick your brains about the structure of the California Public Utilities Commission and better understand uh, where the commissioners come from. Do they represent industry in interests? Do they align with the governor's political positions? Can you talk about the structure of the CPUC and how they relate to the governor? Can I grab that, Chris? That's all yours. <laughs> okay, I'm the lucky guy. Um, honestly, this is a little bit of a mystery to me. Um, as far as I can tell, the CPUC, the criteria for being appointed to the CPUC has more to do with just politics than it does with the governor's agenda per se. Um, and mainly I just look at that because when I look at the folks who are on the CPUC, you know, they, they're all people who have signaled over the years an interest in this kind of area. But the thing that seems to hang them together is they all kind of have some sort of career, you know, being an important person and have some aspiration to just be more of an important person. And so people who have that kind of aspiration in life, and I don't mean to say that in a bad way, that could include some of the people here. You just have your ways of just kind of making your way up the ladder and getting a CPUC appointment is a big deal. It can be a launching off point, you know, to other things. And so that's how it kind of, you kind of get on the governor's list. I think that's one criteria. Another criteria is just somebody that's fairly malleable. You know, like my impression, and I'm, I don't mean to speak ill of somebody, but my impression of Maribel Batcher, who's just resigned and is leaving the CPUC, was she was appointed there by Governor Brown mainly just because she was somebody that Governor Brown could basically, she, she, had, she had been an advisor to him for years. And so he was kind of like, I can just call Maribel and just go, here's what's up. And she'll tell him what's up. So I think governors tend to prefer just insiders, sort of jack of all trade insiders, you know, and then a couple of like experts. But a lot of it is just kind of the usual currying of favor. And it's not necessarily like that the PG&E goes, okay, we gave you a lot of money for your, you know, your election and now you need to appoint this person. It's more just kind of the general inside stew of politics that gets people on. And then once they're there, um, here's what the problem is, is once they're there, the agency itself is just like corrupt to the core. I mean, like the staff who are there are just, it's all this just terrible revolving door of people who like spent their lives working either for a utility or in sort of like the utility orbit. So all they know is this, like what Chris, you know, said, this 19th century centralized model, you know, that just doesn't work anymore. And they're either uncreative or on the take. Um, some combination of that, mostly uncreative. And so then the commissioners get there and, you know, they're not total experts. So they just sort of get blown around. And then when you have like jillions of utility lobbyists surrounding you, it becomes that. And then it just becomes this gross echo chamber. And then you just add in like the usual corruption in politics, like the governor, you know, so try to walk this tightrope. And so that's what you get. You get this thing. And then unless a governor really, 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 really inserts himself into the details, you just don't break through. And so what's really needed here is like a wholesale change to the utility business model. And that leadership is not gonna come from people like the CPUC. It's gonna come external to the CPUC. It's gonna be either the legislature taking a stand or the governor deciding that that's actually important um, or a ballot measure. Um, and even then you'll still have to contend with this sort of insidery thing. So then there also has to be more of a political movement on top of that to get this governor and future governors to actually put like real leaders on the CPUC who not only have a spine, but also have a vision and who come out of our world. So you can see where I'm going with this. We have a lot of work to do even beyond this one very particular fight. And it seems worth it to me just because so much of what we're trying to do is intertwined with energy. 
And um, so that's that's the answer. It's, it's, you know, one more thing just to illustrate it is PG&E's lead lobbyist. Their lead lobbyist on the rooftop solar proceeding underway at the CPUC right now is Carla Peterman. Two years ago, Carla Peterman was a CPUC commissioner. Um, so this just revolving door, you know, it's just what you get, but it doesn't start as that corrupt thing. It starts as just insidery, blah, blah, blah. And then it just evolves into gross revolving door corruption. That's a great answer. Thanks, Dave. Um, I don't see any other questions. So uh, April, I'll turn it over to you to uh, say a farewell on our behalf. Great, thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Excellent. Um, thank you, David and Chris for um, highlighting you know, the important points tonight. And we really appreciate your time and um, yeah, your expertise on this topic. So thank you again. You know, CDC was founded on giving the desert a voice on topics related to energy planning and at the time, um, really irresponsible energy planning. And so we, um, you know, certainly were founded on the mission of bringing a smarter model that included point of use to um, California and to the West and certainly um, to the California desert and to protect the resources. So this is at its core, one of our most important um, values and topics. And many of you here on this webinar have helped to advocate for this. And so in order for us to really put our um, boots on the ground and sort of money where our mouth is on this again, we need your voice to um, you know, lobby on this topic and to speak out. And David's given us another opportunity here on October 21st. So please log in, speak at 10 a.m. Um, public comment begins and, you know, let the governor know that this is an important topic and why it's important to you as an individual, as a resident, as a consumer. And um, we really have to change the paradigm. And the only way that's going to happen, as David said, is, is with public voices and outcry. And so thank you again, and please use your voice on this topic. We will also be um, looking for future letters to the editor and op-eds. Um, CDC did a webinar on how to do that, but we're happy to help you or um, help ghostwrite. So contact us about that, but a very important topic. And I'll just um, remind everyone, you know, we're all volunteers. Uh, CDC has been in existence since about 2007, and we are funded all by private donations and the occasional grant to put on uh, webinars. And again, hopefully soon in-person workshops um, on various topics uh, related to smart energy and uh, conservation values in the desert. So thank you again to everyone. And um, we really appreciate your time. Please give us any feedback on um, how we can improve these or topics that you would like to hear about. All right, anything else that I missed? No, thanks, April. And uh, I wish everybody a good night. We'll sign off. We're gonna post this webinar and the resources uh, from the webinar on our website in the coming days. And we'll send out a follow-up email with some of these resources. And we'll see you all on October 21st. Thanks for joining us. Thanks everyone.